Hey, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. It is my honor to have with us right now Daniel Villegas and his attorney, Joe Spencer. You may remember Daniel. We covered his trial last week. He was on trial for murder from way back in 1993. He was actually convicted. Uh, I believe he was 16 years old at the time. He spent a lot of years in prison. And just last week, he was found not guilty in his third trial. Daniel, how are you this afternoon, sir? Doing pretty good, thank you. Thanks. Joe, how are you, sir? Doing good, thank you, sir. Thanks. I appreciate you gentlemen joining us. Before we get into this, I want to take our viewers back to just this past Friday and watch this emotional uh, reaction from Daniel here in court. Take a look. If the defendant will please stand. In the District Court of El Paso County, Texas, 409th Judicial District, the State of Texas versus Daniel Villegas, number 940D09328. Verdict form B. We, the jury, find the defendant, Daniel Villegas, not guilty of... Is this your verdict? Juror number four, Mr. Contreras, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number five, Mr. Miranda, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number six, Mr. Pa, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number seven, Ms. Luna, is this your verdict? Juror number eight, Ms. Gonzalez, is this your verdict? Juror number nine, Ms. Mr. Hunt, is this your verdict? Juror number ten, Ms. Guido, is this your verdict? Is this your verdict? And juror number 12, Ms. Estevane, is this your verdict? The court does find this to be the verdict of the jury and will be accepted. All right, Daniel, I think the entire world wants to know, prior to hearing that not guilty, what was going through your mind in those seconds that you awaited for the judge to read that verdict? Uh, what was going through my mind was I... Uh, you know, I was wondering, you know, if I made the right choice on behalf of my kids on not taking the Alfred plea. Uh, I knew, you know, I was confident, you know, that, you know, I wanted to prove my innocence and that I am innocent. And my wife was with me and, you know, she helped me make the decision. So, you know, I had her on my side, but I was wondering to myself, did we make the right choice for our children? You know, because um, basically the impression we get with that, um, you know, with that issue, you know, taking it to trial a third time. And uh, with the Alfred key, I would be able to raise my kids, no doubt. And in this case, you know, we don't know how it's going to turn out. You know, you, you're confident that you're going to win. You're confident that, you know, you're being innocent that this time around just is going to be served. But at the same, at the back of your head, when it's actually happening, you're wondering, did I do right for my kids? Right, absolutely. And kids are everything. Joe, let me turn to you, sir. When, when you took on this case, was there any doubt in your mind that eventually you would get to exactly where we are right now? Well, I sure had a lot of doubts. And when the family first came and approached me about the case, and I found out it was about a 16-year-old young man that had been in prison at that time about 14 years, and he had been convicted uh, after the second trial, and he had confessed on it. Uh, and they asked me, what can you do? And I said, it's going to be very difficult. So they started looking through the case, and they brought me the transcripts of the first trial, the second trial, the investigative reports. It was very clear to me that Daniel was innocent. Uh, and so when I communicated to the family, I told them, you know, Daniel's innocent. And they said, great, you're going to get him out? And I said, no, not quite. It's not going to be that simple. We still had to go through the hard process of a writ of habeas corpus, presenting all the evidence to, to the judge, have him make finding a fact, uh, conclusion of law, and a recommendation on Daniel receiving a new trial. 
goes up to the Court of Criminal Appeals in Texas, which is, I believe, one of the most conservative courts in the country, and have them make a decision on sending it back. So there was a lot of doubt as to what we were going to finally get here, but there was never any doubt as to uh, Daniel's innocence. Right. And, and Daniel, speaking of the confession, a lot of people, and listen, I was in law enforcement uh, for many years, a lot of people just don't believe that someone would confess to something they had nothing to do with, a uh, coerced uh, confession, if you will. But I always think back to uh, the Central Park Five, right, and uh, look at how many years those men now were in prison for a confession that... Uh, something they had nothing to do with. So uh, going back to when you were 16, walk me through how we got to this confession that you gave that detective. Uh, I didn't understand the question. How, how did you get to that confession? How did I get to it? Uh, well, when they had, uh, they picked me up at my house and they had me, they didn't even realize I was a juvenile. They went in there to not even arrest me or to arrest a friend of mine and um, that was staying with us at the time. So when they got us into the, you know, when they arrested him, I stopped the police officer on the way out the door and asked him uh, what was this about and if he had an arrest warrant. And that's when he asked me for my name. And when I told him my name, he literally bum rushed me, threw me down on the floor, and then they handcuffed me and said, oh, we want you too. You, you, you're wanted for capital murder also. And then that's when uh, they picked me up and then... Um, you know, I was getting drug out, and I was just freaking out because I didn't know what was going on. I was like, what? What are you talking about, you know? Um, so it was kind of mind-boggling. And then, uh, you know, we had a uh, – it just kept on since when we went in the car to – I mean, the whole night, they just kept badgering me and badgering me and talking about how they're going to do this to me, and uh, they're going to you know, they're, they're gonna throw me in prison. We know you did it, and um, it just was back and forth. Got it. Now, I, I believe there was at some point uh, allegedly some corroborating statements from someone you know, David Ringel, about your supposed confession to this crime. What can you tell me about that? But I, what I can tell you is that on, on David Rangel's uh, statement, uh, you know, none of the statements, including Daniel's own confession, was corroborated by any of the physical evidence, nor was it corroborated by the eyewitness testimony, because you had two surviving victims that survived the shooting. And what they testified as to what they saw and the events that took place that, that night contradicted what Daniel put in his confession. If the police officers had just followed the evidence, they could have found the alternative perpetrator, who we believe is actually responsible for the murder of these two young men. So it was mind-boggling for me, that all they did was once they obtained the confession, they forced it out of Daniel, they put blinders on to everything else. Uh, but none of those statements are corroborated by any of the physical evidence or the eyewitness testimony. Right. Uh, and I just want to be able to give our viewers an opportunity to actually hear what David Ringel had to say. Take a listen. The defendant told you that he committed the shooting? Yes. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, when he told you he did this, was this a conversation that you had in person with him or over the telephone? With the detective? With the defendant. Let's, let's talk about when he told you he did this. That, that, that's my question right now. Over the defendant. When over the phone. When he told you he did this, was it in person or was it over the phone? Over the phone. And do you remember who called who? I believe I called him okay. that particular day. And do you remember what day it was no, that this conversation no. took place? It was probably during the week. Okay. Have you had an opportunity, since we've never met before, have you had an opportunity, Mr. Renhill, to look at the written statement that you gave back on April 21st of 1993? I've had. I've okay. had a chance to glance over it. How recently? Probably in the past couple days. Okay. If at any point, since I think we're all in agreement here that our memories were better back then than they are now, okay. if at any point you want to look at the statement, all you need to do is ask me, can I see my statement to refresh my memory? Thank Fair you. enough? Sure. Um, I have a copy ready. Would it help to refresh your memory um, to look at your statement to tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the day this conversation took place? Yes. All right. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes, sure. May the record reflect I'm showing defense counsel uh, the statement by Mr. Ron Helm, dated 421-93. Okay. Yeah, I believe you gave two statements, Your Honor. I'll, I'll take them all up there. 
and they can he can have them. Mr. Eichel, I'm going to leave these for you. Do you recognize these two statements? Let's start there. Roughly, yes. Okay. And this first statement is a typed statement. Would you agree with that? Yes. And it contains, is this your signature? I'm sorry to reach over you. Is this your signature on the second page? It is. All right. And the other statement that we're going to talk about is a handwritten statement. Is that correct? Correct. And the handwriting, whose handwriting is that? That isn't mine. Okay. And that is also dated 421 of 1993. Correct. Okay. So these are going to be here available. I'm going to leave them up here. If you need to refresh your memory to look at those uh, during my questions. Thank you. Okay. So the question I was asking right now is, do you remember the date that this conversation took place? And if you need a second to look at your statement. Between my cousin and I, correct? Correct. It says Wednesday, April the 14th, 1993. Okay. So on Wednesday, April the 14th of 1993, you called your cousin. Yes. What was the purpose of calling him? Usually when I called him, it was more of to see what he was doing over the weekend. Okay. Since I lived in the lower valley, I would sometimes visit my family. Okay. Oh. Okay. And so this, this uh, there's no way we would have remembered this now, but on the statement back then, it's saying Wednesday, that this was a conversation that happened on Wednesday. Okay. Okay. Is that what that says? Yes. All right. So you call him, and um, what does he tell you regarding this incident? What does he tell me regarding the incident? Yes, sir. From what I remember, what he told me was when we initially were, were speaking, we were just more of shooting the breeze, and then I think the conversation came up just because it was pretty popular in El Paso during that time. Usually when there was any kind of, act, excuse me, any kind of activity, um, we, you know, we would talk about things because sometimes we knew people that may have been hurt. And oh. so this particular conversation, um, I don't remember how exactly it came up, but then we started uh, discussing it. Okay. And what did he tell you? He told me, uh, guess who did it? And okay. I was, I don't know who. And then he said, well, guess. And I'm like, I have no idea. And so we kind of went back and forth a few times, and then he says, I did. And so... During this conversation, um, I could hear Marcos Gonzalez laughing in the background while, while he was discussing this. Okay. So he says, I did it, and do you ask him or follow up why? I did. Okay, again, that was testimony from Daniel's cousin, David Ringel. Joe, you, you mentioned that there was no physical evidence tying Daniel to this crime. And, of course, that old saying, uh, an admission of guilt is not proof of guilt, right? The state still has to prove their case. I want to switch gears and shift over to Detective Marquez. Has anything uh, happened to him disciplinary-wise? Any charges been brought against him for this? Well, he does have a history with internal affairs, uh, and he, he has a history of uh, using these coercive tactics. During the writ of habeas corpus hearing, where we presented witnesses to get Daniel out of prison, I had I cross-examined him for seven hours on the stand. The state never even called him in this trial just because his credibility is totally shot uh, in the El Paso County. Uh, but uh, he's just not a reliable detective. Uh, he's talked about how he puts on costumes, Dr. Smock, pretending he's a, uh, somebody else in order to get people to confess, trying to pretend he's a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Uh, he, he's the type of detective that when other detectives couldn't get a statement, they would send in Detective Marquez and he would get a statement. Got it. That's uh, it's interesting, especially with all those uh, internal inf affairs uh, allegations against him. Daniel, so what's what's next for you, sir? I mean, this is finally behind you. What's next for you in your life with your family? Uh, one of the people that was as next in our life is that we're going to be more part of a proclaimed justice. It's a um, it's a group of people and uh, lawyers, and we got investigators and stuff um, that help other wrongful convictions. You know, we help uh, get other people out of prison who were wrongfully convicted. Uh, so that's going to be one of the major things that we do, you know, carry on forward, you know, uh, enjoying life. That's that's very heavy on our heart. And I mean, we really have like four cases right now that people are asking us and emailing us for help on. So, uh, you know, we look at those and, and uh, talk to Proclaim Justice and see if we can get them on or how we can go about it. Like, 
type of stuff. Okay, is is there a website or somewhere people can actually find that to actually help out? Or Got it. Daniel Villegas, Joe Spencer, we appreciate you joining us here on the Law and Crime Network again. Uh, this is all behind you after so many, many years. We appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you. All right, thank you, gentlemen. We are actually going to take a quick break. We will have so much more to come here on the Law and Crime Network. You don't want to miss it. You never know who may show up. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.